Should I go live? Just confirm when we, if you're watching the stream. Okay, I'm going now. So it's going live. We're live. Something's going on here. Can you see it? It says an error occurred. <laughs> yep. Okay. Brilliant. Hi, guys. Scott Mansell from Driver61 here. Pleasure to have you with us uh, today. This is our first live stream uh, with the hotlaps.io uh, data logging um, analysis tool. Um, we're going to be doing uh, a, a couple of live analyses tonight um, of some of our subscribers' laps, comparing them to our um, coach uh, benchmark laps and, uh, and talking about how these drivers can improve. So we're just going to wait a couple of minutes uh, while everybody comes online. And uh, really sorry to hear the news about Murray Walker um, a bit earlier today. Such such a legend in motorsport and Formula One. So uh, best wishes to, to, his, to his family. Um, like I say, we're going to be using uh, the Driver61 Hot Laps uh, software tonight, which is a really quick way to improve your lap times, improve your technique, um, and make your sim driving more consistent and the cars uh, easier to drive when you are on track. So I think let's let's get into it, let's let's get going. Um, the first thing that we're gonna talk about is is why, why is data important? Um, and I just spoke about it uh, quite briefly there. But, you know, what are these kind of squiggly lines that we're seeing on the screen here and how can they improve your sim race racing? Well, as you may know, uh, I've been racing in the real world all my life. I've been coaching for many, many years now, over 15 years. Um, and the issues that we see in the real world are very similar to the issues that we see um, in sim racing and the blockages that drivers have mirror across the two um, disciplines very, very similarly. Um, and so data logging is a really important tool when you're thinking um, about improving your technique and your speed on track. And it's, it's a great way to hone in on any issues and highlight any issues you may have when driving on track because you can see them very, very easily. Um, and especially when you're comparing your driving against uh, a pro level driver, you can see the areas where you are losing or sometimes gaining time. And so with that um, kind of direction, it means that you can improve much, much faster than if you're just grinding out lap after lap after lap. Um, so really important and, and it's efficient. That's the main thing. It's very efficient with your time. Yes, of course, we can just grind away and uh, find lap time kind of through brute force. But if you do use data logging, you can really hone in on, uh, on any issues that you might have and, and figure it out much more quickly. So let's just introduce you quickly to our hotlaps.io software that we have here. Um, I'm not actually controlling the software. We have Mike Winter, uh, my partner here at Drive61 Sim Racing, controlling the software. Um, so if there's sometimes a little bit of a delay, that's the reason. But first of all, let's let's show you the software. So as you can see on the screen here, we've got a number of things going on. Aside from the navigation at the top of the page, on the left, you can see the circuit map. Uh, you can see here that we've got Silverstone Grand Prix. Um, and you can actually zoom in on these areas to see what the exact racing line is like, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Then below the track map on the left-hand side, you have the two um, 
driver lap times that we're comparing here. So you can see the driver on the left is doing a 201.9 and the driver on the right, the benchmark driver, is doing a 1 minute 58 dead. Uh, and then, of course, you can see the sectors broken up and the differences in the sectors, uh, which is also very important, which is we're going to talk a bit more about later on. And then some uh, some quite cool information there regarding time um, flat out on the accelerator and time on the brakes. Uh, quite interestingly here, you can see that um, time on the brakes for the faster driver is a second more than the than the slower driver. So that's quite, that's quite an interesting thing to look at. And you might want to, we're going to understand that a little bit more. You can also see top speeds and then the average speeds as well. Um, and a bit more about the number of gear changes. But into the really interesting part of our software here. You can see that uh, on, on the right hand main part of the screen, we've got a number um, of graphs. Uh, the top one, the first red line that you can see here, is what we call the delta um, comparison. So it's the, it's the difference between the two laps and the time gained or lost between the two. So what it does is it really enables you quite quickly to see where you're losing the most time. And of course, that's then the area that you should probably prioritize to look for your, your speed on track. So you can see here across these two laps, there is a kind of gradual um, loss across the laps with some quite big lumps in. So where Mike is on the screen now, you can see that the line rises quite quickly. Uh, this is, I believe, coming into Vale um, about halfway around the lap am i right um yes i am so just just so you know the start finish um in in this particular piece of data is on the old start finish line at silverstone not the formula one um start finish line so that is veil and then coming on to the the new start finish line the f1 um, start finish. So there's a big chunk there. Um, there's also a reasonable chunk um, coming through Maggots, Beckett's and Chapel toward the start of this lap. We often see that across uh, a number of drivers. But anyway, we'll get into that um, in more detail in a little while. The next graph, Dan, that you can see is the speed trace. So we've got the faster lap, which is the blue line here, versus the slower lap, which is the red line. And we're going to be going into more detail a little bit later on how exactly um, this driver could have gone uh, more quick, save some lap time. And when I talk about um, the data analysis here, I'm going to broaden the scope a little bit more so that all of you guys can actually apply some of these learnings to your driving yourself. But looking at the speed trace here, you can see that the red line is a little bit below the blue line. The area under the, uh, the difference under the line there, as you can see, where it's bigger, obviously you're losing more time because the driver is slowing the car down a little bit more. The next graph down is the throttle trace. Now, it does look a little bit noisy at this wide open uh, view, but when you zoom in, you can really see the details of the inputs of the drivers. And these two next parts of the graph is, is where the magic happens. This is the beauty of using hotlaps.io is that you can really look at the throttle and the braking. So Mike's just zoomed in now. And then you can analyze the body language of the car, the, the, the way the platform is behaving, and therefore the balance of the car and differences in technique, which will really find you quite a lot of lap time. So we've got the throttle trace, as you can see there. Then we've got the brake trace. So instantly here, we can see going into Maggots and Beckett's, um, Mike zoomed in here, the red line, which is a slower line, the brake pressure where, where Mike is um, on the graph now is significantly higher in terms of the peak pressure and also longer, right? So this driver is taking a lot more speed out of, um, out of the car than the blue driver. So maybe that's something that we'll look at. But again, we're going to go into that in a bit more detail a bit later on. Next part of the uh, software down is the steering angle. So this is just basically the the number of degrees of steering angle each driver has. So you can see differences here in the technique. Um, I've actually learned quite a lot from this, especially from, from Darren, who who's, um, whose data this is, where he's actually quite aggressive on the steering. I had to in, in, increase my aggression on the steering angle um, in comparison to Darren here. So you can see some insights here. And then finally, 
um, we have the coasting part of the graph here. Now it's just um, one or zero essentially. And this is really, really important to really understand um, the, the way a driver approaches the corner. So coasting is when you're neither on the brakes nor the accelerator. So it kind of tells you what the minimum corner speed is, where that is in the corner. And therefore you can gauge whether a driver is kind of going into a corner really quickly, maybe apexing uh, a bit later or apexing a bit earlier in the corner. And this is really, really important, um, really important information because you can see differences in techniques. A lot of drivers may be going into the corner too quickly. And so that coasting part of the corner will be too late. Other drivers will be going into the corner too slowly. And so that will be too early. And when you can compare this against a professional driver, you can really see how you need to move your judgment going into a corner. We also, um, if you go back to the top mic, if you go back to the top of the screen, we also have uh, gears, so you can check that you're in, in the right gear. And we also have RPM, so you can check, um, especially if you're changing ratios or something like that, you can check the differences in, in RPM, as you can see um, just at the bottom of the screen there. So that's, that's a quick, yeah, Okay, sorry, I'm just talking to Mike uh, on the uh, on the headphones here. So if you would like to submit um, a lap uh, now, you can head over to Driver61 and, um, and take a look at the software and, and, and run some laps. And then we can potentially take a look at your lap live um, on this stream. Mike, what's the, um, what's the exact URL? Oh, okay. Okay. Mike's put the link in the description uh, below this stream. Yeah. I, yeah. So also guys, if you do have any questions, put them in the chat. I can see them just here and we'll do our best to answer them. So if there's anything that you don't quite understand or any additional questions that you have as I'm analyzing this data, just drop them in the chat, say hello, and I'll, um, and I'll do my best to answer them. Okay, Mike, I think we're ready. Should we get into the first analysis? So while I'm doing this, I'm also going to be talking about my methodology as, as um, I use the, the data. So we always start from this broad view because we want to, first of all, understand where we're, where we're losing the most time. And then once we've done that and we're looking at the, the, the whole um, view, the whole lap, we want to see if there's any patterns. So are you as a driver losing the most speed always in fast corners? Or is it always in big braking zones? Or is it always on the exit of hairpins? You know, if you can find a fundamental issue, a pattern uh, where you're losing time across a lap, so you might find it in three or four different places, then you can work on that fundamental technique as we teach about in, in our other training programs. And then you'll find a big chunk of lap time because you're not just trying to break a little bit later in one corner, you're actually finding time across the whole lap. The, the issue that a lot of people have with data logging is that they'll just use it to kind of spot breaking points and try and break a bit later or maybe break a little bit earlier. But actually, you need to go a level deeper than that. We need to understand the patterns across the whole lap and, and what that means in terms of, of our fundamental um, technique. So, Mike, if you just move the cursor to the to the outside so it's not it's not covering it. There we go. So it's not covering any of the graph. OK, you just hold it there. So we're looking at the speed trace here. So we're going through the lap. And I mean, you can see if you know the Silverstone circuit, we've got COPS, which is the first corner. So the trough, the first trough that you can see, Mike, if you can just go there, the first trough that you can see in the speed trace, that's um, that's COPS there. So you can see the red line is losing quite a lot of time here, a lot of speed there. There's a there's a there's a big chunk in terms of the minimum corner speed. Then. Um, if we go through just to the end of Maggots, Beckett's and Chapel, you can see particularly the first part of Maggots, 
uh, and Beckett's there, where Mike is now on the graph, there's a big difference in the speed. And we saw that we saw that when we kind of zoomed in a bit earlier. But interestingly, the last part of um, Chapel, where you're coming onto the hangar straight, the next the next trough along, Mike, um, the the speed is pretty much the same. The driver's losing a little bit on the exit, but actually he's not doing too much of a bad job. So although he's losing a bit of time, that wouldn't be a priority to look at. So at the moment, it's like, well, this driver's struggling a little bit in the in the fast corners, right? Then we're coming through to the to the next part of the lap, which is Stowe. Just move the cursor along a little bit, Mike. And you can see through Stowe there that actually he's not losing much time at all, right? There's not there's not much difference in the delta time up on top, and there's not much difference in the speed traces either. Next part of the circuit along is Vale, which is the big heavy braking zone. Um, and the tight left followed by the tight right. So just move the cursor along a little bit more, Mike. And you can see there that in the middle of uh, of Vale, um, the driver's, yeah, just there, just there. He's uh, he's losing a little bit of time there, but it's not a huge amount, right? It's It's a chunk of time, but he's losing more time at the start of the lap. Then we've got new turn one, as I call it, after the, uh, after the start finish straight. Um, it goes in quite well, but then on the exit loses a bit of time. So interestingly there, because um, turn one on the F1 start finish straight is qu actually quite similar to Cops, um, where he's actually losing a lot of time. So it's a bit unusual that he's losing so much time in the first part of the lap, but not so much just here. Then we come round to three and four, loses a bit of time on the exit. Uh, but not too bad at all. And then down into Brooklands and Luffield, a little bit, little bit of time on the apex there, uh, but nothing in Luffield. So, I mean, the the, the time here and uh, as well, if you compare the speed trace with the with the delta, um, most of the time is in the first three or four corners. Then there's a lump at Vale, and sometimes when you know it doesn't look like there's that much speed difference there at Vale but because you're going so slowly um, actually in terms of time it makes quite a big difference so what I would look at with this driver is first of all in the quick corners um, so Cops, Maggots, Beckett's Chapel and then secondary we'd look at the at the slower corner Vale and then turn th well turn three on on the F1 circuit so Mike if you could just zoom it into Cops also, um, sorry, sorry. Can you just bring that, bring the uh, that up again? So when you when you are on this this main view and you select corner, as Mike's doing up there, you can then see the sectors. And this isn't individual corners; it's it's sectors. So um, we've got what have we got? Seven different areas of the Silverstone Grand Prix circuit. And so if it's a sequence of corners, like we have in turns two to five, Maggots, Beckett's and Chapel, the software groups those together, right? Because one corner will influence the following corner. So you can't have them as separate corners. It does a great job here of, of grouping um, the corners that we need together. The other great thing uh, about this part is you can actually see where the big time loss is. So you can see that turn one, we're losing almost half a second. Turns two to five, Maggots, Beckers, and Chapel, seven tenths, almost eight tenths of a second. So that's a that's a big, big time loss. Um, and then the other big time loss is turn seven to nine, which is Veil. Um, and then at the end of the lap, actually, interestingly, we need to take a look at that in more detail later because that's that looks like a big time loss. And whereas the speed trace doesn't look that bad. So anyway, let's first of all look at turn one. Remember, we're looking for patterns and you should do so with your driving. We're looking at the fast corners to begin with. So we've got the red line, who is the slower driver, and we've got the blue line, who is um, dulking. So the first thing that I'm looking at um, is the speed trace, the deceleration of the speed trace. How steep is that angle coming down? Are they coming down together? Because sometimes going into a fast corner, um, pro drivers actually won't break that hard because if you break really hard, you drop the nose 
of the car you shift all the weight to the front and um and it can make the car difficult to manage and make the car uh, quite light at the rear so we're looking to see if the deceleration is the same so mike if you just move the cursor to the right just a fraction what you can see there is if, if you look at the, the, the speed trace coming down, so where the driver's beginning to get on the brakes, they're pretty much parallel, right? They're, they're decelerating um, at the same amount. So there's no issue there in terms of the peak brake pressure. Then I'm going to take a look at uh, the braking trace. So the, the, the fourth graph down. And quite simply here, you can see that the red driver, the slower driver, who's losing half a second in this area, is simply getting on the brakes earlier to the same pressure as Darren. Um, but then at the, the tail of the braking pressure, so Mike, if you just can kind of hover over the tail of it, what you can see here, and, and it, it doesn't look like a huge difference, but in terms of the platform of the car and the way the car enters the corner, it's absolutely critical. So the red driver here is keeping the peak pressure. So you can see that the line stays at the top for a bit longer. He's keeping that pressure on for longer. But then when he releases the brake, it actually happens pretty much twice as quickly as Dolking's lap as Dolking's trace. So he's on the brakes full, the red line this is, and then coming off the brakes very quickly. So if you then translate that into what the car's doing, he's getting on the brakes, the weight's going to the nose, and then the suspension's compressed at the front of the car, and then he just lifts off the brakes, right? And the front of the car pops up because of the suspension, springs um, unload themselves, and the weight transfers very quickly. So either, the, the, whatever happens here, when you release the brake pressure so quickly, the balance shifts very quickly as well because the, 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 the weight transfers back um, away from the front very quickly. And so it lowers the overall amount of grip, but it also makes the car much, much more difficult to drive. And this is one thing that we see with a lot of drivers. And think about whether you're doing this in your own driving, is when the, when the brake pressure releases so quickly... It pops, you know, it pops the weight backwards, and and you, these drivers are giving themselves a harder job to keep the car on the limit. What we actually want, as you can see with the blue line here, is a a, a, a more gentle bleed off the brake. So we're just allowing the car to come up much more gently, right? And that means the weight transfers to the rear of the car more slowly which gives you much more feedback, gives you much more time, much more track distance to absorb that difference in, in the grip levels, the, the weight balance. So as the weight shifts backwards, those rear tires are being pushed into the track more, right? And that's why you get this shift in balance. The opposite is happening on the front. As the front suspension rises up, the weight shifts backwards, um, the front tires, because the weight is shifting backwards, they're, they're being pushed into the circuit less, right? So we want to manage this part of the braking. It's critically important. We want to manage it as smoothly as we can. So what might be happening with this driver, and this is something that we see with many, many drivers, both in the real world and the sim, is that because the trail part of the braking isn't that smooth, He's lowering the overall grip level. He's making the car harder to drive, right? So when he enters the corner, it might feel like he's on the limit, right? The car might be having a bit of a moment. And that means, because his trail braking isn't right, that he's having to brake, I don't know, um, what's that? Uh, almost 20 meters earlier than Darren because he hasn't got the car at the turn in and at the mid corner. The, the, the car, you know, you, sometimes you follow a car on track and I've, I've sat next to drivers while they're doing this, and they, they a, a similar car will come past them, and they won't believe that that car's got so much grip, right? Because they might be going into the corner and like having the car sliding around, and then somebody comes past them, and the car looks absolutely planted. And yes, of course, there might be a little bit of difference in tires and, and, and weight and a bit of setup, but even if the cars were exactly the same, with this driver, popping off the brake pedal as he is, um, he will have less grip when he turns the car into the corner and it will be more difficult to keep on the limit. So therefore that driver is having to brake earlier because he's got less grip when he turns the car in, okay? 
I uh, I hope that makes sense. Let me know in the in the chat if you're if you're following there. Let me know if you want more detail or less detail as well. It'd be great to hear from you in the chat. So, Mike, let's now go through. I'm, I'm not going to worry too much about the steering angle and, and the coasting. I want to go through to Maggots, Beckett's and Chapel, and I want to see if this is a similar problem when we get there. So, what we're seeing here, we look at the speed trace at the top of the screen. You can see now, this is what I mentioned at COPS. If you look at the rate of deceleration, so just go left a little bit, Mike, at the start, going into Maggots. Right a little bit so you can see the, the lines coming down. You can see the red line is dropping down much more steeply than Darren's blue line, which is much more of a, a slow deceleration. Then we go into, um, into the braking, look at the braking, and you can see that this driver is significantly heavier on the brakes. So interestingly here, he's getting on the brakes at the same point as Dolking, but it's getting on much harder. And then look at the, the, the tail, look at the trail part of the braking. He's actually just popping off the brakes again, right? Very quickly. So again, he's gonna have a car that's difficult to drive. Um, this, is, this is quite interesting when you look at the accelerator as well. You can see here that the driver, the red driver, is braking harder, so he's knocking a lot of speed out of the car, and then instantly straight back on the accelerator, right? So he's stopping it and then going again, and stopping it and going again. You can see that pattern continue through the whole phase of the corner, actually. And this is what we see with a lot of drivers. They feel like they should either be braking all the time or getting on the accelerator straight away, you know, either braking or accelerating all the time. And this is why this data is so powerful because sometimes when we're out on track, there's so much going on. It's actually difficult to to be exactly conscious about when you're doing these inputs. And that's what the, the kind of look through the keyhole that the, the data logging gives you here. I've sat with many drivers in the past and they've guaranteed me that they're not doing something, whether it's on the brake pedal or the throttle pedal. And then we download the data, have a look at the data, and they can't believe that they're unconsciously doing something on the pedals. And they, they would swear that they're not braking for a corner or lifting or whatever it might be, or getting straight back on the accelerator as this driver is, when in fact they actually are, right? So that's why this, this, uh, this data logging software is, is so, um, so important. So we look at this driver who's stamping on the brakes, then making up for it by getting on the accelerator. He's making the car work too hard. So look at the brake trace, look at the throttle trace, and imagine what the car's doing. He's stopping it, right? Bang, the nose is going down, keeping the nose on, then accelerating, right? And the, the weight's going back. The platform's working really hard. Same as I said at COPS, right? He's, he's making the car work uh, a, a, a little bit too much. Bang, like popping off the brakes. The weight's shifting around um, in a way that isn't as refined as we want. And of course, the more weight that we transfer forward and backwards all the time like this, the less overall grip we have and the more difficult the car is to drive because it's seesawing over a short period um, on the track, which makes it incredibly hard to drive. Whereas you look at Darren's trace, He's actually braking softer. He's releasing more smoothly. Look at that brake trace. Look at how it curves down when it comes down, the blue brake trace. And then interestingly, there is a blip on the accelerator, but that's him coming down the gear in the middle of the, in, in the gap there. But look at when he finally does get back on the throttle. It's a little um, entrance here where he comes up to 15, 20%. So he's settling the car there and pausing before he then accelerates through the middle part of, uh, of maggots. Then he's on the brake, and the, uh, the, the red driver's actually not doing a bad job here. It's still a little bit steep when he finally gets off, off the brakes. Look at how steep the, the trace is where he comes off. Yeah, there, just there. Um, but then look at the gaps that Darren has in terms of his braking, just letting the car breathe a little bit and then getting back on the accelerator. And it's the same all the way through this sequence. He's allowing the car to coast much more than the than the red driver. So Mike, if you can just go down a little bit to the coasting section of hot laps. 
and here it's it's as clear as day, right? So remember, the coasting here um, is where the driver is not on the brakes and not on the accelerator. Now, the first two coasting periods that you can see there, it's a little bit uh, noisy or a little bit misleading because Darren's blipping the accelerator as he goes down a gear. So actually, that coasting period should be both of those at the start, Mike, on the on fully on the left. These two should be joined together. They should actually... So you can see that period there in the middle of the corner where he's coasting for a long time. How many meters is that? Just, uh, it's like eight, 8.24, all the way to, yeah, 60 or 70 meters, Um if our maths is fast enough. That's a long time, right? And and so with that coasting, that means that his change in speed um, is less, right? He's just kind of floating the car through there. He's trying not to take too much speed out of the car. And he's trying, most importantly, not to disrupt the car. Whereas the other driver, the red driver, there's no coasting period. He's smashing the brakes and then getting back on the accelerator. So he's going to have oversteer on the entry, right? Because he's hard on the brakes, the nose is down, and the rear is kind of up in the air, turns it in, it's going to feel really, really nervous on the rear. And then he gets on the throttle and the car sits back and he's just going to understeer, right? So he's got the kind of worst of both worlds when he's doing that. He's got oversteer and then understeer, uh, most likely. Then when we, if we go to the next coasting period, again, you can see that the, uh, the, the, the red driver doesn't really have a period where he's coasting. Uh, Darren has a, has a decent chunk. Um, and then finally, the last part of Chapel, um, Darren's coasting period is, is significantly bigger uh, again. And another interesting point here um, is that Darren's having to brake a bit harder. You might have spotted into the last part here, um, just going into the final right, um, Chapel, Beckett's Chapel. Um, Darren's braking harder. Now, that's... Um, because he's just carrying so much more speed there, right? But you can see here that actually the trail is nice and smooth, and you can see that kind of um, consistency in Darren's trail braking across the three braking events here. To give credit to the red driver, he's actually coming off the, the brakes quite smoothly. Not Still not quite smooth enough, but he's, he's actually much better there. But then, this is another common problem that we see, you can see he's so eager to get on the accelerator. If you look at the throttle, so if you just go directly up, Mike, look at the red trace here for the for the red driver. He's he's actually if you just move left a little bit, there's a little blip here where he's trying to get on the on the throttle, um, and then likely because he's trying to do it all too soon, trying to make the car work too hard, it's probably understeering uh, on the exit. Then he's realised that and has had to lift. So you can see that the, the throttle actually goes to zero again. And then he's back on the accelerator and finally makes his way out. If you look at the speed trace at the top of the screen, you can see that he actually enters this part pretty well, um, almost matches Darren. But then the exit, Mike, if you just go directly up, then the exit of the corner, go up to the next to the speed trace. That's it. The exit of the corner, he, the, the, the red line is below in terms of the speed trace. So you can imagine there that he's gone in to the left, tried to get on the throttle. The car hasn't accepted it, understeered. His think, he thinks, oh, I'm running out of roads. I'm running wide. And then, and then had to lift. You can also see that if you look on the speed trace, you can see a, a gray section um, on, on the graph. Now, hot laps will automatically pull up um, this, this gray background in your data when you're more than two and a half meters off the racing line. So you can see that all through this section, this driver's actually been pretty close to the racing line, never more than two and a half meters until we get to the exit. So you look at that throttle trace, you look at the difference in the speed, and then you think, actually, maybe this driver is running wide coming out of here because because he's more than two and a half meters away from Darren's line. So what can we take from this driver? Um, the first thing, and normally we would just recommend drivers to work on one thing in their next session, right? We don't want to go out with a massive list of 10 different things to do because none of it is going to stick. 
we want to give the driver one simple thing to do. So for me, the first thing that I would try and to get him to work on would be the sensitivity in the trail part of the braking through cops and through this section. Because it's that trail part of the braking that affects how the car feels on the corner entry, which then dictates when you get on the brakes on the following lap, right? Because if the car feels horrible going in, you're going to have to brake earlier. However, if you get the car feeling good on the entry um, and at the apex, then you will be more willing to go faster and you'll, you'll have more ability to go faster into the corner. That would be the first thing. Then the second thing I would say to this driver is we, we need to make the car work um, less hard, right? We need to give it an easier job. I can imagine this driver now. I don't know this driver, but I can imagine that they're trying to force the speed to come. They're trying to make it happen. They might be a driver who's got some experience. You know, they're not too far off Darren's pace here. They've done a lot of, of, of sim time, but they're just getting frustrated. Um, we've, I think we've all been there where we're just trying to force that speed to come. And this is what it looks like in the data. Hard on the brakes, trying to get on the throttle as early as possible. But actually, when you think about the dynamics of the car, the platform and how that's behaving when you're going through the corner, this is not the way to drive. We can't force the speed to come. And typically, when that happens, when a, when a driver's you know, got decent feel, um, but they're driving the car too hard, they will typically be 2 to 3% off the pace. You know, they, they might be able to, you know, catch a slide absolutely perfectly. Their lines will be good. Their vision might be, you know, fine. But because they're trying too hard, because there's, there's, there's no breath in the middle of the corner, because they're not carrying the entry speed, because the car doesn't have as much grip, because it's on the nose, it's on the rear, there's too much going on, um, they will be uh, a couple of percent um, off which is, uh, yeah, this drive is what, two or three, three percent off? Okay, so they're the quick corners. I would get the driver to go and do a number of laps, and this is what, what you guys should do as well if you, if you feel like this. Go and have a think about whether you have this breath between your braking and your accelerator, especially in the quicker corners. Um, and then work on his trail braking. And, and actually, at the beginning, I would just get him to be conscious just about the brake pedal how is he feeling that brake pedal how gently excuse me how gently does he need to bleed off the the, the brakes um next we're going to look we have a question yeah i got a question yeah if you don't have comparison data so the question is, if you don't have comparison data, how would you use telemetry? Um, that gets very difficult, and that's why we um, have benchmark laps here from, from pro drivers, because you want to, you, you need to compare against a, a clean lap. Uh, the problem is, of course, you can compare against your own lap, but if your technique is fundamentally wrong, um, then you, you get, you're going to struggle, right? It's, of course, it's a bit better than you just grinding out laps and laps, but, um, but you do, you know, th this is the whole point of, of, of why we are using hot laps. Um, you need to have that benchmark lap to compare against. Okay, so we're getting a question that is, does it work on F1 2020, Mike? Yeah, yeah, it does. If you uh, if you sign up, we can get you on the on the beta group. Um, okay, Mike, do you want to zoom into? Uh, let's have a look at the the next biggest section, which is 15 to 16, coming towards the end of the lap. That's Brooklands and Lafield. And, you know, the interesting thing, as I mentioned here, is that the speed trace doesn't actually look too different, right? Darren, um, Darren's the blue line and uh, the other driver is the red line. But because you're going so slowly in these sections, so this is Brooklyn's, the left hander that tightens up, followed by the 180 uh, degree right hander. Because they're so slow, you actually lose a lot of time. If Even if you lose one mile an hour or two mile an hour, you, you actually lose a significant time loss. So let's look at the speed trace first of all. 
Um, the deceleration coming down, Mike, if you just go up to the speed trace, the lines are actually pretty well together. But then as we get into the corner entry, so a bit further along here and into the minimum corner speed, that's when the, the two lines come apart. And then on the exit as well, um, we struggle. And then Luffield entry is okay, and then the exit isn't quite as good. So let's go a level deeper. Let's try and understand that a little bit more. So we're going straight into the braking. We're going to try and understand this. And so the first of all, the red driver is getting on the brakes a little bit earlier. Um, he's then actually like bleeding off the brakes, um, as we can see here, which is... So this, if you look at the shape of the braking, and just Mike, if you just move the um, cursor out of the way, there we go. So we're all looking at the brake trace, the leftmost brake trace, which is for Brooklands. We're looking at the red line here. The the driver's almost got the br the brake trace the wrong way round. So it, the 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 line comes up, so the pressure increases. It that it's then at one hundred percent pressure, and then and then you can see actually there's a curve to it like this, and then. As he gets to the end, then he just drops off the brakes very quickly. What we actually want is to come off the brakes relatively quickly at the beginning. And then the last bit, that's where we really need to control uh, the car. So imagine what the car is doing. It's diving on the brakes. The, sp the springs are compressing. You can actually let the first part of the car up quite quickly, but we don't want it to kind of pop up and overshoot, right? So we can let the first bit up quite quickly, but then we bring it back under control and then finally release, right? Does that make sense? Right, yes, okay. So um, as Mike's just mentioned to me, he's ahead of me looking at the steering angle. So what you can see this this drive, if you look at the, the, the brake trace, it kind of, it feathers off and then and then he kind of comes back to a level again and then drops off very quickly. And you can see that it actually crosses over Darren's line there. So it, when when he's turning into the corner, so if you look down at the net, at the steering angle, uh, when he begins to turn into the corner, Mike, so just a bit to the right, further to the right, just there. This is, you can see that the, 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 if you look at the blue line, right, because the red line's wrong, but if you look at the blue line, that's where they're just beginning to turn in. You can see the line comes along and then drops down. That's where they're turning in. At that point, if you look at the red brake trace, he's actually got a kick of brake pressure there. And then if you look at the speed, the, the steering trace, which is the one below, which is Mike is flo floating over now, just go to the steering trace, Mike. You can see that these two lines go the opposite directions, right? So this is where the first drive is turned in and then got a massive kick of oversteer, right? So that's really going to ruin his uh, his corner entry there. So like I said to you, it's like this driver has good confidence on the limit. He's quite, you know, he might be quite happy having the car moving around, but he doesn't have the finesse that's required to be right, right on the pace. So, um, so that's the problem there. He's got his, again, he's got his trail braking the wrong way around. Um... If you look in the uh, in 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 the middle of the corner here, Darren's actually getting back on the throttle, um, just there. So we're looking at the throttle now. So if you know Brooklyn's well, you'll know that it's a a, a corner where the 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 line tightens up. You need to gently increase your steering angle as you go through there because the track tightens. And so as you're decelerating sometimes and adding more steering angle you're putting more lateral load in the car. And so it can be quite easy here for the rear of the car to step out. So what you can see here, and this is a, an interesting fundamental technique that you can pull out of the data when you look at it like this, is Darren's actually getting back on the accelerator ever so slightly, um, the blue line here. So you can see there where, where Mike's just hovering over. It's actually getting back on the throttle. Seems strange, right? Because at this point, we are before the apex of the corner, way, way before the corner of the apex. Darren isn't getting back on the accelerator to increase the speed of the car, right? If you look at the speed trace, it's pretty much static um, coming across here. So yeah, it's, 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 it's actually decelerating, even though it's back on the accelerator. So why is he getting back on the accelerator, right? Again, think a bit deeper. Think about what the car is doing on the brakes turning the car in we're still decelerating the car here often going into brooklands can feel oversteery and so if he just very very gently gets back on the throttle not to accelerate 
but to settle the rear of the car. If he gets back on the accelerator, the, the rear will just sit down just slightly because the car won't be de de decelerating as quite as quickly and it will give the rear some more grip, right? Remember, we get back on the throttle, that sets the re rear of the car down, pushes those rear tires into the track a little bit more and equalizes the balance. This is what we're always trying to do on track. We're trying to use all four of the tires to their maximum capacity from the time we get on the brakes to the time we're going down the next straight. And that's what Darren's doing here. If he continued to break through here or just didn't get back on the throttle, the rear of the car would be sliding. So the rear tires would be using 100% of their grip, but the fronts might only be using 80%. And so with this imbalance, and this is going back to what I mentioned before, with this imbalance, even though you're on the limit because the rear's sliding, actually the front's got some excess grip. And so he's getting back on the throttle here just to shift some of the, that grip to the rear of the car so that then he can be using 100% of the front and 100% of the rear, right? And that's what we're looking for. That's where this 1%, 2% comes from. These two drivers are going to be on the absolute limit, right? We know that the red driver is on the limit because we can see in the steering angle that the car's sliding, right? He's got opposite lock. But he's going slower than Darren, right? This goes back to the same point that I was saying. You can lose grip in the car. You can make it have less grip than a competitor. Darren doesn't have any op uh, opposite lock here, um, but he's going in faster than this driver, right? And it's all because of that brake trace and then getting back on the accelerator. The, the important thing here to realize with, with your own driving, no matter how what experience level you are um, or where you are with your driving, it's about establishing whether you're using the front axle and the rear axle uh, to their full potential. Um, it's about assessing that all the time, uh, forward and back. Um, that's constantly what I'm saying to myself when I'm driving. Oh, could you know, is, is the car understeering? Is it oversteering? If it is, then how do I shift some grip to, to that part of the car when I need it in the corner. And it's amazing how much of this you can actually do just with your technique. Um, you know, it's n we don't have to jump to set up straight away. There's a lot that you can do with your technique. And, you know, it's, it's um, black and white here. Red driver's got oversteer and is sliding, um, even though he's going slower than Darren in the entry. Um... Darren's actually made a little bit of a mistake here, I think, maybe struggling in the middle corner seat. You can see there where Mike is now that he's had to have a bit of a lift. So as he's coming out of there, um, I think he's probably getting just a fraction of oversteer there. So you can see that he's kind of, there's a little dip in his steering trace. So he's just, just right on the limit there. So a li little bit of a mistake, but it won't have cost him too much time. And now we're going to look at Luffield, which is the tight right-hander. So again, uh, we're looking at the at the brake trace here um, and, and trying to understand what's going on. Darren's actually a bit earlier um, on the brakes. He's arriving uh, a bit more quickly, so that's fair enough. But again, look at the trail part of the braking. Look at the tail to it. Red driver, peak pressure for longer, but off to zero much, much sooner. Darren beautifully bleeding off the brakes there. Look at the, how he's coming off the brakes in such a smooth way. It's almost robotic. It's, re it's really, really consistent. And that's why, you know, it's so quick. So again, the red driver's got less grip. He's got a car that's more difficult to drive. Um, and so that will then put him offline. It probably means that he won't get... So, well, it, you can see in the speed race, he's not got such a good exit. And so this, the, the time delta on the top line is just continually dripping away. Um, you can see here that the, the, if you look at the throttle trace, that the red driver um, is trying to get on the throttle at the same point as Darren. But because of the way that he's entered the corner by popping off uh, the brakes, he hasn't got the grip underneath him for the car to accept getting on the throttle. He's got less grip than Darren has. 
Darren gets on the throttle pretty quickly, actually, quite aggressively here. For the first part, the car's accepting it. And if you know Silverstone well, it's like a long, this is a long, long right-hander. So you can get back on the throttle. And I, I presume what's happened here is Darren's just oh, tried to take a little bit more steering angle here. The rear of the car's probably stepped out just, just, on, just on the exit here. Um, or maybe he's touched a curb and he's had to have a slight lift. So he's probably struggling with the, with the rear here. Um, and you can see in his in his steering trace that it's a little bit uh, noisy. It's up and down, which generally means, you know, when you go into the corner and then you're kind of oh, just just like this, just kind of playing with the steering wheel. Um, and he's had to have a lift. So, again, it's cost him a bit of time. It isn't the absolute perfect lap, but it's still a very quick lap. So, again, remember at the start, I said we're looking for patterns. Biggest pattern here is this driver doesn't have the same grip that Dolking has because of his trail braking. So we would go and put him through some trail braking exercises and really work on that. Okay, Mike, I think that's enough for, for this driver. If anyone's got any questions before we jump into the next one, please, um, please let us know in the chat. I thought that I could see them here, but I might not have it set up properly. So Mike, you'll have to relay them to me um, if we have any. Hmm, that is interesting. Okay, so we're just taking a look um, at s a another driver who submitted a lap, and we're not going to analyse it because it's Silverstone again, but one interesting thing here is very quickly, you can see that he's not even getting 100% on the brakes. First of all, I mean, th there's a, a couple of issues here, but he's not whether it's the way he's got his hardware set up or he's just simply not getting on the brakes hard enough. It's a pretty pretty basic uh, mistake. But even with that, he's still doing, you know, his, granted his four seconds off the pace, but it isn't that bad considering he's having to brake much earlier uh, than Dolking because he's not getting to full pressure. And is that the same, Mike, is that the same across all of the big braking zones? Yeah. So you could... You can um, you can see that there. So it might be that this driver isn't even aware that he's not getting full brake pressure. And again, we don't know if it's the hardware, the software, or whether he's just not pushing the pedal hard enough. But what this allows you to do is hone in on that very quickly and uh, and figure out. Whereas he might have carried on for well forever really without really realizing that he's not getting full on the brakes. Okay, let's get into Monza. Yeah, let's do Donington. Okay, my claim to fame about Donington. <laughs> I uh, I was previously the lap record at this track, lap, lap record holder at this circuit, so I know it very well. My home circuit as well, which is great. Um, so we have a couple of laps here to analyze. The blue line um, is the faster driver, 126.4. And the red line is a slower driver, a 131.8. Um, first of all, we're going to do that kind of broad analysis, see where we're losing all the time, see what the patterns of the driver are, and then uh, and then go into some more detail once we've seen that. So, looking at the uh, at the comparative lap time, so the the time delta, the red line at the top of the screen. We're seeing fairly big chunks across all of the corners, apart from, um, interestingly, red gate, which is turn one there, and then the final two turns, which are coppice. Oh, no, sorry. Um, we're on the Grand Prix circuit here. So the, the, the final two hairpins. So remember I said uh, with the first analysis, we're looking for patterns. In this instance, we can say that this driver actually isn't too bad in the big braking zones. So that's Redgate, which is a slow corner, and the two hairpins on the on the Grand Prix circuit. Um, it's not too bad, right? We're not seeing too much uh, time difference or difference in the speed traces here. However, where we see the big problems are... So this first, the first big trough that we see, which is probably the biggest time difference... Um, Mike, if you just go towards the start of the delta there, so we can just see what it is. 
uh, just before he goes into turn two, well, into the old hairpin. That's it. Just go right, 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 right. Just there. Just before, just a bit earlier. There we go. So four, almost five tenths, and then just after the corner, Mike, up to up to one point, up to one point five. So he's lost a whole second through one corner, right? So we can just quickly, of course, we can see this time difference in the select corner option as well. But sometimes it's nice just to to flick through with the with the mouse here. So the the old hairpin, um, it's a quick corner. You can see the the minimum speed is quite high. Um, and then we're seeing uh, not quite as significant drops through the following corners, which is McLean's, uh, Coppice, and then the, the chicane towards the end of the lap. Um, so what I want to do is we're not going to worry about the first corner or the last two corners because that isn't the main, the main problem here. Um, let's jump into uh, the old hairpin. So that's turn four. Can see he's losing eight tenths of a second here um again we're going to start off with the speed trace we're going to look at the the rate of deceleration and although these lines are quite a long way apart they are um parallel so that the rate of deceleration is the same um however then where mike is now with the cursor you can see the minimum corner speeds here are drastically different we've got 130 kilometers what's the minimum speed of the, the blue line mike at the apex there yeah 130 versus 160 so six, uh, 30k difference so we need to try and understand that right so on the speed trace um the first thing to note is that there is a gray patch um, on the corner entry, uh, which means that the driver is more than two and a half meters off the racing line. Um, if you look at the uh, top left, you can see the difference in line there. Now, it's so significant here that you can see it even in this small display. Now, I'm not going to ask Mike to do this, but you can go to racing lines just at the top of the screen and you can zoom in on this area of the circuit and you can actually see how big the difference is. Um, physically see the difference in the racing line which is pretty amazing to be honest but even in this display you can see it up in the top left where you see the line and the dot um, you can see that the blue line um, is much further over to the left so the faster driver here is actually getting the car further over to the left before the right of the old hairpin and uh, you can actually see there if you look at the display um, just just cruise along there very slowly, Mike, so we can see what the difference offline is. So go left, go right to the start of the corner. Yeah, so at points we're like four, four meters, three meters, three and a half. At that point we're four meters, 4.1 meters, right? So if you look at the top left of the screen where the line is, so you can see where we are on the track, that's just about where we're getting on the brakes. So if you know Donington Park well, you come down the Craner Curves, which is the fast flowing bit where you come down the hill. And the final left is often quite difficult, right? Because the car wants to push over to the right. So this driver is actually, before all of this, probably compromising his line somewhat. And the car is just naturally pushing itself offline. And he can't get it back over to the left anywhere near as well as, uh, as the benchmark lap that we have here. Four meters is, you know, two car widths. It's a, that's a lot of lot of space and so therefore he just simply can't get through this corner as quick because it's it's essentially to, to, to the red driver it's a tighter corner right it, the, the racing line's not very good so with all of this stuff um, and with the previous analysis the driver was quite close to the lap time um, and so we were talking more about the balance and how and the trail braking these kind of more detailed things this driver has got a problem with the racing line so the first thing that i would say to this driver is go out there, perhaps just drive a little bit slower and try and get the car over to the left so that we can flow through the old hairpin. Oftentimes, if, if we just told him to go out and go as fast as he can, he'll continue to make the same mistakes. So he needs to take a step back before he can take a couple or three steps forward. So go. I would, I would advise to go out, go round um, 80% and just make sure your vision, as we teach in our in our programs is in the right areas you're looking in all the right spots because you need to give yourself the right visual information so that you're looking in the right areas and then the racing line will come naturally 
um, this driver needs to work on that first. Before we get into braking point, before we get into trail braking, before we get into steering throttle, all of that stuff, he needs to go and look at, um, at his racing line. So, Mike, I'm not actually going to go into any more detail about that because that would be where I would um, ask this driver to go next. Let's look at the next biggest time loss, which is turn six and seven. Oh, yeah. Nine and ten. Let's go. Sorry. Yeah, let's go nine and ten then, which is the chicane, I think. Yeah, the chicane going on to the GP loop at Donington. So we haven't got any um, any gray areas on the speed trace, which means that the driver is pretty much on the right racing line. Uh, so in this one, we can take a little bit um, of a, a, a closer look at his technique and why it might not be going so quick. First thing to note is that he's overlapping the throttle and the brake quite significantly. Um, very simple thing here, but if you look at the throttle trace and then the brake trace for the red line, notice the throttle release, the rate at which he's coming off the throttle is quite slanted, it's quite a slope, whereas the blue line is much quicker in terms of how he's getting off the throttle. Like it goes to zero much faster. So this drive is just simply getting off the, the throttle too slowly. We want to be getting off the throttle, obviously, as quickly as we can. Then if you look at the braking trace, the, the, the steepness of the slope um, is less steep than the blue line. So it's also getting on the brakes too slowly. So this driver is kind of gently getting off the throttle and gently getting on the brake pedal. So he's losing time there, right? There's, there's a bit of a disconnect there. Um, also, it's pretty obvious that he's getting on the brakes just way, way too early. But with the difference in lap time, so this driver's like five seconds off the pace over uh, a 90 second lap. So that's five or six percent, right? We don't just want to say to this driver, oh, you know, you're braking way too early, brake a bit later, because that will get him into trouble in, in the corner. Okay. Now it may be the case that we do actually, you know, we need to say that. But what I'm saying is, if if you are a decent chunk of time off the ideal lap time, don't just try to get there through braking later and harder. Um, oftentimes, it's got other things to do with vision or just not knowing the track well enough, and so on. So let's look at this uh, brake trace for the for the red line. He's on the brakes much earlier than than the than the benchmark. You can then see in the trail part of the braking, which actually, um, if it was zoomed in a lot, that would actually be quite nice. But it's just way, it's over way too much distance. You can see there, if you go to the, where he comes away from 100% mic, just there. So that's at uh, 861 meters and then go to where he finally releases the brake. Yeah, so 9.12. So we, we're a big chunk, 50, 50, 60 meters there where he's releasing the brake. That is too long, right? And so what this driver is actually doing is <laughs> he's just braking too early. He's braking, slowing the car down, and then realizing that he's going too slowly, releasing the brake quite early, and then pausing at the end and finally releasing it with the little toe that you can see at the end of the brake trace there. The other thing to notice is that is much much deeper into the corner uh, than the than the than the other than the other driver. This happens so much in the real world, um, where a driver will first of all get on the brakes too early, then they'll think, "Oh, I'm going too slowly." Then they'll release the brakes, and then they'll get into the corner and go, "Oh, I'm going too fast," and actually stick on the brakes for a little bit longer and perhaps get on them harder. So that's why with the red line, you can see he begins his release earlier than the blue line, but then he has to hang on to it for longer, right? So this is mis mismatch. Now, that sounds complicated, but the point is you can look at your data, you can, you can figure this out. And the reason that the driver will be doing this is I guarantee he's not looking in the right area on the track. He's looking too close to the car, He's looking just in front of him, whereas he needs to be looking through the corner, down at the apex, and, and moving his eyes between um, the entry and the apex. This driver isn't giving himself good visual information. And when he's doing that, the corner is a bit of a surprise to him, right? It, he, he can't understand how much speed 
to take into the corner because it's simply not looking in the right place. So my advice to this driver would be to get his vision up the road much further, look a couple of seconds ahead as we teach in our training programs, look through to the apex, look through to the exit, back to the apex, back to the exit, and then we're out the corner. When he does that, he'll find that he'll have much more confidence, carry much more speed into the corner, and be much more consistent. And to be fair, that could be the problem, the same problem that we're seeing coming down the craners and going into the old hairpin, right? He's just not aware of how much track is on the left. And so he's restricting his racing line somewhat. Um, Mike, let's take a look at another, um, uh, another corner. Okay, we've got a question coming in. Yeah. So the question is, if you counter steer on entry, does it cost you um, at the mid corner? At, at the mid corner and exit. So that's that's uh, it's difficult, right? You've the the point is you've got to try. Um, if you're counter steering a lot, you're like this. You're backing the car into the corner. Yeah, it's going to be costing you time. But even if you're counter steering a little bit, think about what that means, right? You're counter steering. You're putting opposite lock into the steering wheel it means that the rear of the car is sliding the rear of the car is at the limit what's the front of the car doing the front isn't at the limit the front's got grip but how big is that difference and the point is is that we don't know and so what you would have to do is gradually over a number of laps when you turn the car into the corner try and transfer more of that grip to the rear of the car so you've got a better balanced car and you keep on doing that until the rear's actually got more grip than the front and it understeers, right? If, you, if you've got oversteer on the entry, you don't know how much you've got, right? You, you just feel that the car's light at the rear, but you don't know how significant the balance difference is because you're not at the limit of the front. So each lap, you have to chip away with your, changing your trail braking, giving the rear more grip, more grip, more grip, doing it slightly more each lap, and then one lap, it will understeer and you know that you've gone too far the other the other way and then you bring it back a step okay mike so okay so let's let's pick another corner what we want to do is try and confirm whether this driver is actually um not looking uh in in the right area um so where are we we're at coppice i think yep yeah, turn eight coppers. Um, so we're looking at the speed. Uh, the other thing that um, smells like poor vision is when, if you look at the speed trace coming down here, the two are parallel, right? The driver, again, the red driver's early on the brakes. But the two are parallel. But look, as the driver comes down into the entry of the corner, he continues with this linear de decrease in speed, just where we are now, Whereas the other driver is actually, it comes down linearly and then it kind of curve, comes to a smoother curve, right? Whereas the red driver comes down and then is at his minimum speed and then that's it, right? And that's where the two lines diverge even more. And um, again, you can see uh, there's, a, there's a difference. As with the previous driver, the trail braking isn't particularly good. Um, he's just popping off the brakes very quickly if you look at the braking where Mike is now and then he's trying to jump on the accelerator same as the other driver so he's slowing the car down too much realizing trying to get back on the throttle um, just follow that throttle trace a, a bit more because he's just something quite interesting tries to get back on it that's all okay but he'll probably give the car understeer and then if you go a bit further along Mike that's confirmed because as they're coming out the corner he's had to have a big old lift because the car will be running wide and it'll be running out of track. So it all kind of links together there. Um, again, you can see that that's confirmed in the differences with the coasting graph that we have um, at the end. I think that's a gear change in the middle, but otherwise that co that coasting would be uh, would be quite significant. So one thing that you can see uh, just to co just to confirm here, so that. Um, that lift off the accelerator is actually oversteer because if we come down to the steering trace, you can see on the way out here, the drivers had a big, um, big increase 
in uh, or decrease rather in the steering angle so that's that's opposite lock so he's tried to get on the throttle and the car hasn't accepted it particularly well but again over slowing the car going into the apex not quite getting the exit right um it, it's all vision it's all vision we've not got the you might hear me talk about fluidity quite a lot in our programs um this driver doesn't have fluidity linear on the brakes deceleration linear deceleration off the brakes get it in bang it's very um kind of stop start driving there's no fluidity to his driving and generally that comes because of poor vision vision being in the wrong areas at the wrong time okay mike okay monza Okay, so we've got a couple of laps here. We've got Dolking, who is the blue line, and we've got um, another driver who is the red line. So looking at the main overview again, we can see this driver's two and a half seconds uh, just in the left-hand panel there, two and a half seconds off Dolking's pace. Um, quite hard to find time at Monza sometimes. Obviously, the, the braking zones are, are really important here. Um, so the, if you look at the speed trace, uh, there's not that much difference. Uh, but if you look at the delta on top of it, you can see some lumps. Typically on the corner exit, which is interesting, right? So already thinking maybe there's some traction issues here, struggling to get on the throttle properly. Um, no issues, well, no big issues with the racing line because we can't see the grey background anywhere. But you can see there that the delta where Mike is hovering is after the apex, right? It's after the minimum corner speed. It's after the trough in the speed trace. So that pattern continues across the rest of the lap. So if you just go to second chicane there, Mike, you can see that the delta increases significantly on the exit. Uh, next two right-handers, not too bad, actually. Um, coming out of the Ascara chicane, massive chunk there so that's and look at how different the speed traces are there so that's a mistake i would say you can also see even though it's quite noisy at this view the throttle trace is uh is is coming off so he's made a mistake there um and then into parabolica bit of time on the way in bit of time on the way out uh so let's zoom in um let's look at the the mistake first of all mike because i just want to confirm that that's a mistake eight and not eight eight nine ten yeah so looking at the speed trace red driver here carries more speed into the corner than dolking and uh i think you can probably all understand what goes on next um the, darren will be right on the pace and so this driver just can't make it work on the exit it has to have a big lift and uh, it's probably running wide. You can actually see here if you look at if, if you look at the brake trace, um, he gets on the brake significantly later than Darren. Um, how many meters is that, Mike, on the braking? So just go from the peak to the ten meters, yeah, ten meters, ten meters or so. Well, Pete, yeah, okay, when they're initially getting on the brakes, yeah, ten meters or so. And then this driver's having to <laughs> carry on the brakes as he's going through uh, the left. And that probably um, is causing the car to slide and then just kills his exit. Because if you know that part of the track, it's left, right, left. Um, you mess up one part, it puts you offline for the following bits as well. Um, just to let you guys know, and Mike know, if my camera goes off, it's because the battery's going. But uh, just give me five seconds and I'll turn it back on because I've got another battery here. But I might disappear for... The, the, the stream will continue, but I personally might disappear in the bottom left of your, your screen. So I think we can put this down as a bit of a mistake. 10 metres late, too late on the brakes beyond a pro driver is quite significant. Um, so I'd have to speak with that driver... Uh, regarding why why are they so much later on the brakes are they not using references properly um, or was it just a you know just a, a bit of a mistake on this lap so let's go to the next biggest um, issue turn one yeah 
So here we go. Now this is this is this is interesting, right? So let's look at the um, the delta time. You can see here, Mike. Just put the put it on before we begin to turn the car into the corner. So just before just before we turn the car in. So go along, just there. So on the brakes, he's losing a tenth and a half. Whole scheme of things, um, as a kind of percentage of the loss, the whole loss across this sector is half a second. So we're losing a tenth and a half on the brakes, but the main loss comes after, right? Look at the delta. Just where we are now is where we're losing all the time, which is on the exit, right? The exit of the left. If you look on the left-hand part of our screen, you can just see there. It might go to the middle of the of the big time loss, just there. Okay, now look at the dot on the on the screen. You can see that we're losing it all at the apex and then coming out of the exit. So you can see the dot on the on the track map on the left-hand pane of the screen. This is why this this data is fantastic, right? Because you can say, look, that's where I'm losing the time. Where am I on the track? Okay, I know I need to go and try and do that in my next session. So let's get into the details of what's happening. Um, li little... Um, Little thing with the brakes, whereas he's not getting to peak pressure quite quickly enough. Uh, so that's just a little thing, but it will be costing a bit of time. Peak pressure's good. Um, begins to trail off the brakes in, in a good area. The first part of the corner isn't too bad. Um, probably hangs on to the brakes for a little bit too long, to be honest with you. But the real time loss doesn't come from the brake pressure, it comes from the throttle. So look at where the driver gets on the accelerator here um, in, and, and, and look at the track map on the left. So Mike, just go to the start of his throttle uh, pickup, just there, a bit further, just the first lump of it where he goes up to 60, there. So that's just at the apex of the right. You can see here that, that Darren's actually um, got on the throttle a bit early if you look at the blue trace, but then is off it. So this driver is trying to get more substantially on the throttle um, earlier than Darren is. And so he's going to be changing the balance of the car. Mike, could you just go down to the um, the steering angle to see if we've got any confirmation there? Yeah. So look at the red trace. And look, if you draw a line down from when the driver begins to get on the throttle, the red driver begins to get on the throttle, and then compare that to the steering trace. So just move it right, that's it, from there, Mike, and then draw straight down to the steering angle. Can you see the separation in the lines uh, with the steering angle? So the red driver is actually adding even more steering angle here. So getting on the throttle a little bit and adding more steering angle, think about that for a second. What's going on? He's getting on the throttle a bit earlier. The weight's going to the rear of the car. It's understeering. And that's forcing him to add more steering angle. Take these few pieces of information that we have in the data and run it through what's actually going on with this car and this driver. He's trying to get on the throttle too early. And therefore, he's lowering the grip of the car He's got an imbalance in the car. It's understeering. It's not oversteering. It's understeering. And it's costing him a big chunk of time compared to Darren here. Go back up to the throttle trace so we can look in detail for the, the next part. Because Darren's been a bit more patient on the accelerator, the car will be better balanced. And then he's able, actually, between the two corners to get flat out just for a little bit, but he's able to get flat out. Then he gets off the throttle. Um, so Darren here, the blue line, interestingly, earlier than the red line, and he doesn't go to 0%. He maintains a little bit of throttle here. And this is the details for you fast drivers here. This is the quite detailed stuff. Um, Darren's managing the platform of the kite with incredible refinement here. That little bit of throttle means that the deceleration when, um, when he lifts off isn't quite as severe as the red line. So the weight isn't jumping to the front of the car quite as quickly, meaning that it isn't shifting the balance quite as quickly, and the rear is maintaining a little bit more grip. Whereas look at the red line. 
He's staying on the throttle a bit longer going into the left. Then he's going to zero and just letting the car hang there. Look at how, how long he's off the throttle for. So you can see the gap there, just where Mike is. There's a gap there in, in the middle. Now let's go down to the steering angle. And again, you can see that this driver is struggling. He's added uh, um, a bit of a bit of understeer there into the car. You can see he's kind of turning the car even more. So he's, he's being too violent with the car. Remember earlier with the other analysis, I mentioned that if you shift the weight around too quickly, it, it's difficult to drive the thing on the limit, right? Because you're, you're changing how much grip you've got extremely quickly. This driver is doing that. He, he, he isn't able to be refined right up to the limit because the limit's shifting around too much. Whereas Darren is ma managing the weight of the car, managing the balance of the car much better. And therefore, he's actually got a, a car that's easier for him to, to keep right next to the limit. And so this kills the driver at the apex, um, affects his exit. Let's look at the final part of the throttle. Darren's then able to get, because he's got a, a car that's got more grip, he's able to get to full throttle quicker. And this is where we see the big increase um, in in, in the delta, in the time loss. So you might think at Monza going into turn one, it's all about the braking. But this driver only loses 20% of his time in this section in the braking. It's actually in the details of managing the weight of the car and trying to maintain the highest grip level that you can um, that he actually loses the speed. And that's why, again, this data logging is so powerful, why hot laps is so powerful is because we can get into that detail. This driver might be thinking, oh, I just need to brake later. And that, that may be why he got on the brakes later at Ascari, right? Because, because he feels like that's the problem. A lot of drivers kind of two-dimensionally will think that, oh, I just need to brake later, I just need to brake later. But it isn't that. It's about, you know, it, of course it, it can be. But when you look at the detail in the, in the data logging like this, you can see the details. You can actually get proper confirmation about where there is time to be made up and exactly how much. So, Mike, let's go into the next chicane, see if we've got a similar issue. And here we go again then. So, red line, getting on the brakes a bit earlier. So, it's actually braking a bit earlier here. Peak pressure is the same. Deceleration is pretty good on both of them. And he just moved the cursor along a little bit. So you can see there on the speed trace, the minimum corner speed is a bit off. What's the difference just there? So nine kilometers an hour. So yeah, this is a big chunk of time. Looking at the delta time, you can see that all the time loss is from this first apex. So again, look at the, um, look at the track map on the top left. The main part of the, 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 the time difference, and that 0.72 is actually the cum cumulative uh, time loss, not the time loss in this sector. So that's why it's 0.7. Uh, 0 0.7, and then by the time we get to the second apex, which is just here, it's one, so it's lost like four tenths of a second just between the two corners here. And again, um, I'm going to kind of go over it relatively quickly. It's because he's not managing the balance of the car as well as Darren. Uh, we're not shifting the, the grip to where we need it quite as well. The one thing that I did see um, on the more broad view was that he was doing the two Lesmos pretty well. So, Mike, if you just want to go to one of those, he's only losing a tenth and then even less than a tenth here. Um, you see, there's quite a big difference here um, in terms of what the two drivers are doing. Again, he's not, get, he's not getting to peak pressure, which is a bit bit unusual. Um, whereas, um, and, the, and then the trail part of the braking, if you look at that, he trails the, car, the, the brakes in much, much deeper. So he's got, he has got a slightly different technique than Darren, but he is still losing time, right? So this driver's trailing the brakes in deeper, trying to get on the throttle earlier, whereas Darren's coasting a little bit more mid-corner. So... I would actually mention to this driver to try and actually carry a bit more speed into the into the corner and then get on the throttle a little bit later. It's um you know it's only a tenth of a second in this section, but it's still a tenth of a second in in, in one single relatively simple corner. Let's look at the next section. So, we... okay, we've got a question coming in. Okay.
Okay, so we've got a question um, about taking curb in the chicanes. How much curb, how do you know how much curb to take? Can you see it in the data? Well, again, as with most things, it's about testing different, different. You've got to see, you know, you want to take as much curb as you can without the car being disrupted too much. Um, the way the data can help you is that you can know that our drivers will be using the optimum amount of curb. And so you can use the racing line feature and zoom in on the racing line to see if there's any difference. Or alternatively, you can go to the speed trace and you can see how far off their line are. So here you can see that you can zoom in to the, um, to the chicanes here and you can see that actually um, at, the, at the apexes, they're pretty similar. Um, the uh, the red line is using uh, a little bit less of the of the exit there on the way out. Okay, Matt, let's go back to the main graph. Uh, so let's go to the second second lesson, yeah. No, it's uh, this. This is quite good. So we've got the red line. Here's the here's the slower line. What I will say about this driver is, it seems pretty inconsistent with his underlying technique. Um, in the previous corner, he was on the throttle much earlier than than Darren. Um, in this corner, he's on the throttle much later. Combine that with the fact that he made quite a big mistake going into Ascari. Um, the consistency doesn't seem to be there for this driver. So first of all, as always, think about the vision. What is he picking up on the corner entry? Why is he inconsistent? Is he not looking far enough ahead? Is he not using any braking references? Um, you can see here that he's actually quite significantly later on the brakes than, than Dulking. Um, so it's an, there's an inconsistency issue here. So I'm sure if we looked at a session of this driver, that might be quite inconsistent with with their lap time um that would be that would be the first conversation and again you can see this in the data right if 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 there's actually not too much of a pattern which is the case here you know the other drivers we could see they were making pretty much um the same or similar mistakes in each corner this driver is kind of all over the shop right is two and a half seconds off at monza uh which Yes, yes, it's a, a, a one, 107, 10 second lap, but actually um, it's quite hard to lose, well, not hard to lose time at Monza, but it, it's a relatively simple circuit, so the time differences tend to be a bit less. This driver's, you know, 3% off the pace, but the problem is consistency. So I'd go to him and say, let's, let's work on your vision first of all. Let's make sure that's right. Take a step back, maybe go a bit steadier. Go around at eighty percent. Make sure you get everything hooked up and get into that rhythm. Maybe this driver isn't aware of using braking references. Again, I'd say to him, go around at fifty or sixty percent. Go around slowly. Look at some replays. Make sure you understand where all your braking references are and references that are ten or twenty meters before your braking point or ten or twenty meters afterward. Right, so you have a good awareness as you're approaching a corner. Um, I think that's where the, the first step would be with this driver. Okay, Mike, I think that's enough for, for this driver. Do you want to do a bit of a Q, bit of a Q and A? Okay, cool. Okay, guys, if you do have any questions, um, let us know in the chat and Mike will relay them to me. I do just want to say um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I really appreciate you guys being here. And hopefully you've learned something um, about your driving. It's all about being conscious about your inputs and thinking about how they affect the balance of the car. Um, as I mentioned at the start, it is difficult to be conscious. It's actually impossible to be in conscious of all of your inputs all of the time, right? Because there's so much going on when we're out on track. And that's what the data gives us, that kind of insight into what actually happened and the ability to analyze. So Mike, do we have any questions? 
No, brilliant, guys. Okay, well, there's no questions there. Thank you so much again. Really appreciate it. I think we're going to be doing some more of these, so make sure you subscribe to the Drivers 61 Sim Racing channel. And um, if you do want to uh, check out hotlaps.io, check it out on the Driver 61 website or at hotlaps.io. You can sign up for a trial and um, and see what our data logging is all about. It's absolutely fantastic. Genuinely can find you lots and lots of time on track. Okay, Mike, is there anything else to mention? Right. Okay, cheers, guys. Thanks from me and Mike and uh, all at Hot Laps. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you soon. Cheers, bye. Okay, I'll...